Can you do that today? Is that possible in this gathering? Well, we believe that it is. Give us ears to hear and hearts that are open today to understand that you are so close to us that if you speak, we can hear your voice. Speak to us, Lord, I pray. Help us now in our worship, Holy Spirit, as we come to give thanks to you. In Jesus' name. Now, as you're going to stand up in a moment, I'd like you to turn to someone and say, I'm really pleased they came today, if it's genuinely true. Okay? If it's genuinely true, as you're standing, the band's going to come and they're going to lead us in some worship. And as you're standing, chat to someone near to you, welcome them to church, say something nice. That would be brilliant. Hopefully it'll be true. And let's all stand together. And if you're just joining us, please do come in and take a seat. Oh, I'm glad you are, mate. That's great. I'm pleased I came today anyway. I know. That's great. And uh, the guys are going to lead us in some worship. Amen, amen.
reflecting your glory
consider all the works thy hand have made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe is way. Sing that again, church. Oh Lord, my
like you, oh Lord, I believe. There's no one like you, oh Lord, I believe. We ascribe greatness to you, oh Lord. In the end, Lord, I must you know. Yes, oh Lord. Let's just hang around in the presence of Jesus. Let's just allow the sun of righteousness just to shine. famous in my field but this is what I would say to you today but whatever was to my gain I now consider loss for the sake of Christ what is more I consider everything that I have invested my life in until this point as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish so that I 
may gain Christ and that I may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own anything good about me but only that which comes through faith in Christ we affirm afresh today Lord Jesus we don't have anything to impress you with all we have is ourselves and we bring ourselves to you afresh and say would you come and let us understand afresh what it means to revel to worship in the God who has made something of our lives that we could never make that you have made us good in your sight righteous in your sight and we now stand as sons and daughters of the Most High how can that be but that is your grace love and mercy it has no end it has no depths that we can measure it we can just stand in the good of being the benefactors of the mercy grace and love of God We bless your name, O oh Lord. We bless your name. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. You are indeed a good, good Father. Thank you for your presence now. And as we continue, Lord, in this act of worship today, may that continue, Lord, with our ears may continue with our hearts as we engage to listen may continue Lord as this, as we go to our different venues throughout this building Lord may Lord truth set us free may we know what it is to be free indeed today we worship you and we give you thanks Lord Jesus you are stunning and we revel in you. Ha! There's no one like you. Amen. 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 Wow. What a privilege to be in the presence of God, yeah? Please do come, take your seats. And there are seats. There's a whole row at the front. Please come to the front. There's, don't be frightened of being at the front. And um, our young people will be probably going upstairs at this moment in time. So there's plenty of seats to be had. So welcome everyone. Uh, I wonder if someone could help me by bringing those two chairs maybe to the platform. Ruben, that'd be great. Uh, and uh, if you could make this pulpit disappear as well, that would be, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, no, no service is the same. Every service is different in worship and often in, um, um, you know, in, in temperament and maybe what the Lord wants to do. But today we're really excited. Uh, I'm really pleased that... Um, uh, uh, one old friend, one new friend is with us uh, today, one that needs no introduction, uh, uh, maybe to some of you who might not know him because he, wasn't, he was the minister of this church for about 900 years in, in the 17th century. Uh, uh, yes, he's Methuselah, that's the one. He's the same age, that's the one. Well done, Chris, 10 out of 10. And, and Pastor Claude Errington, let's give him a round of applause. It's all, whoa, 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 whoa. He's coming. Claude and, I, Claude and I meet now quite often. We often meet for a cup of tea and a bun uh, because we're Yorkshire and we talk about buns, don't we? Yeah, uh, guess who pays for them? Yeah. I pay every single time. 
I, take, I have mercy upon him because he's an old, old retired minister now. So we have to be merciful. And, and, and so I do, some of you might not know Claude, but uh, obviously he was, he's the father of the house in many ways. And we honor him. We've always respected him. And we will always continue to do that. He's one of us. Uh, and he's journeyed with HT for many years. And I'm delighted that he's still not only a friend of HT, but he's integral. Uh, and Sue as well. And the whole family. And we are, are, we are deeply appreciative of all of their endeavor many years, over many years. But today... I'm introducing him so that he can introduce our other guest, which is a bit of an odd way of going around it, but because uh, Claude is going to be interviewing Andy in just a second, he's going to introduce Andy and what's going to be happening and, uh, from, from that point onwards. So uh, let's give Andy also a ripple of applause as he comes. There you go. Good lad. Come on, Andy. Andy, I... Uh... I'm just loving this this morning. It's I don't great. know about you, and it's yeah. great. I mean, God, that worship. I go to lots of churches, and half an hour standing is like 24 hours. <laughs> but truly, this morning, I could have stood for another quarter of an hour easily, five minutes maybe, in truth. <laughs> but it was brilliant. I, and I was thinking, I want to book a slot for my funeral here on a Sunday morning <laughs> while I'm here. Can you do that? Do it now. Can, can that be done? A Sunday morning, next week. I'm nearly there, mate. I'm nearly there. It's in the diary. Thank you for that. Uh, well, this is, this is Andy. This is, this is young Andy Frost. I don't know about young, but yeah. Uh, yes. Not and, old as you, so there we go. <laughs> you'll, uh, uh, you, you'll get to know Andy. He's been a friend of the family for quite a lot of years, but especially... Uh, a friend with Richard, my eldest son. Because am I right in thinking, do I remember right, you both went to the Billy Graham School for Evangelism over in the States. You, that's where you met. We did many years ago, yeah. We, uh, yeah, we uh, went out a week early to try and surf, and we spent nights, we had no money, so we slept in a car. I remember most nights getting knocked on the door by a policeman saying, uh, please move on from this area. So it was quite a traumatic experience, really, but it bonded me and Rich together, I think, in some it, To some this way. very day. Yeah. And, and you know... I've not said this to you before, um, that the one thing you've been true to from beginning to end is your particular call to the simple thing, evangelism, telling the story of Jesus. And funnily enough, so Richard has never left it either. The thing that floats his boat is telling the story of Jesus. Absolutely. I think it's the most important message in the world. So yeah, that's why. Yeah. I think it's what my life's all about, really. It's actually how do we share and communicate the Christian faith, relevantly and faithfully, have people discover that truth, that they are loved by God. We're some of those words just now about knowing our true identity. I mean, that's a massive part of it. Actually, we discover, ultimately, who we are and that we are loved. That's a powerful thing, isn't it? And did you feel when we were actually singing that and some of those great hymns that just uh, echo that sentiment, the, the kind of tears in your eyes, you begin to realize, wow, it does mean so much to me. I didn't realize it meant as much to me. I didn't quite appreciate fully the revolution that's gone on in my life. Because sometimes, I mean, in the hundred of life, we're not preaching here, we're not supposed to be doing that, are we? It, it, the kind of thrill of it fades away, doesn't it? But then in, in a congregation like this morning, it just comes racing. It's like the tide in Western Supermare coming in again over all the mud. Yeah, yeah. It's that phrase thing at the end of Luke when the disciples meet the risen Jesus and they have joy and amazement. And I think often we can forget that joy and amazement, but singing those songs reminds us again of that ultimate joy and that amazement at what God has done for each and every one of us. Do you know, I remember just talking about Richard, and I, I got this thing about children kind of leading us into the kingdom. And, and I always go back to this point when... Richard was nine years of age, I think he was. He was in school, obviously. And he started this new school as we moved to Cheltenham because we were the pastors of Cheltenham. He moved into the school. And there in his school, his teacher is a Cambridge graduate, I think, super intelligent. I mean, we're talking intelligence here. And, um, and he tells her about Jesus. And a nine-year-old boy is talking to this kind of highly intelligent woman about Jesus. Moreover, he says, would you like to come and hear more about Jesus? Would you like to come to church on Sunday? 
Now this woman came to church on Sunday. You'll never believe what happened to her. She went home again. <laughs> she, she got amazingly saved. I mean, revolutionized. And she, we discovered that she got a drink problem. And she submitted all that to God. And we took her through a process of coming off alcohol and so on. She went then, gave up teaching, and she went and became a Christian worker. And amazing, one child. Anything like that happened to you? So good, so good. Yeah, I mean, very similar thing with me. My teacher as well, Mr. Humpstead. It's a great name. Mr. And, uh, Mr. Humpstead. Oh. And I invited him to church and became a Christian. The best thing was, I never got in trouble again after that, because he, uh, he became a Christian and was like, I can't punish Andy now because he's been... It was so important in my life journey. Um, and my brother, when he was younger, I think could he modeled at home what it was to pray um, regularly about stuff. And um, I remember at school one day, he was very young in primary school, and uh, one of the kids got hurt in class and was bursting into tears and everything else. And my brother said, well, miss, miss, let's just pray for him. And his teacher was like, uh, what? <laughs> my brother was like, well, let's just pray for him. Pray for him to get better. So she was like, uh, okay. So my brother, aged maybe six, seven years old, kind of got the entire class to be quiet for him and, and prayed for the child to feel better. And the tears stopped. And it's quite an amazing thing, really. Just yeah. when, you, when you model something at home in the church community, that it spills out into every part of our lives. And actually, great seeing kids have that confidence that, well, this is natural what I do. So yeah. I do this in school as well. So, yeah. Yes. And that's it. This is natural for me. Why is it that we have such a great problem with doing the natural thing, and that's just telling people the greatest story that's ever happened in our lives, which is the story of God, isn't it? it, it it's the irrepressible story, really. But we have kind of a... It's hard, it's, it's difficult. I was, in, um, I was in Tesco's. Where every good story begins. Buying yeah. some new clothes. I was in Tesco's uh, with Sue a few weeks ago. And... Uh, we're in the checkout, and I hate checkouts because I haven't yet got the grace of patience. It just hasn't happened for me. And I dislike it immensely. And there's always somebody in front of me that loses their card of a certain age, which is usually about my age. <laughs> and they can't find it, and, and so on. Oh, look at me. I've lost my card, and, and all this going on. And, and I'm getting impatient. Anyway, I get to the, the lassie on the till. And as they do, because they're groomed to do this, have you had a nice day? Uh, uh, and I said, until now, yes. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. And, and she said, oh, is, is it not a nice experience here? I said, no, love, it's a really nice experience. Uh, I said, do you enjoy your job? Uh, she said, yes. And, you know, clink, clink, bleep, bleep, going through. And uh, she said, what do you do for a job? Oh, and I, I, I said, I, I'm a clergyman. And she said, what's one of those? I said, it's a minister. What's a minister? Now, can you ever be given a better line yeah. than that? But I've got a queue behind me. A vast queue. You became all, that person. All listening. <laughs> yes, I became that person. All listening. And, and, I, and I've, I, what I try to do in some of my seminars is get people to share their faith for two minutes to get it into what I consider as, am I talking too much? No. Into, into a slot, you know, you look at the adverts and what they can get, or in the news bulletin, what they get in two minutes is a life story. It's amazing. So I try to get people to condense it to two minutes so I'm skilled. Brilliant. Except for this moment. Ah. <laughs> and, and, and I'm saying, it's only, tell you, tell your story, tell your story, tell your story. And I go, um, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, 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 and everybody's watching me, and, blah, 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 and I'm gone. Couldn't do it. Could not do it. Pressure. Yeah. yeah, I think it's good to practice, isn't it? Practice actually how do we share our story effectively and how do we share it succinctly is important. Not the six-hour sermon, but the kind of drop-its, the things we can drop into conversations. I love the idea that, um, in a way, uh, when you're having a rally in tennis, you're hitting the ball over the net to and fro, and um, sometimes we can be a bit like one of those tennis machines that pelts out balls yeah and we can be a bit like this i'm gonna give you everything in one go yes take everything yes that's not where it should work it's yes. really about dropping something into conversation putting the ball over the net and seeing what gets picked up and then beginning to have a dialogue as things get picked up so i think a simple thing we can all do is this is that if every week what things can we drop into conversations about our faith 
so even maybe tomorrow someone will say, what happened at the weekend? And you might talk about football or about um, your hobbies or about your family. We could just drop into conversation. Oh, I went to church and this happened. Dropping those things in begins to spark conversations, I think, and just see what God's up to. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right there. The exciting thing about this little interview, this is going to go on for two years. <laughs> it's a long interview. <laughs> we are having a partnership with HT, which is my favorite church in the whole world. I'm home. And we're going to have this partnership for two years. And we're going to be talking about that journey a lot and how to express that journey, how to get excited about it again, uh, excited about the story. Because when I became a Christian, that's what you did. And uh, the cares of church life and business, it just kind of all gets crowded out, doesn't it? I, I'm, I'm think, I tell you what, the, the, what we're, going to, we're going to be here for two years and we're going to go through a course together. It's called Emmaus. Now, Emmaus is based on, in the Bible, these two guys, all right, one day are walking down the street from Jerusalem down to Emmaus. Emmaus. And they're as miserable as sin, and they're complaining to one another because it's been a horrendous three days. What we've got here is there's been a trial, and Jesus is in the trial. He's been accused. Now, because they find him guilty, he's going to be crucified. He is crucified. Then they take his body and put it in a tomb. And then all of a sudden, the body gets missing. And so this, these two unknown, really, disciples, just ordinary guys like you, not like me, ordinary like you, walking down together, not big hitters, not famous, not hugely talented, not really gifted, you know, a bit like, and, <laughs> and they're talking together and they're grumbling together, really. So we don't know what's going on. This is terrible. We, let's get away from Jerusalem where everybody's talking about it. And, and, and we should have known better. We gave our life to this and so on. And, da, 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 da. And, and, and all of a sudden, there's another guy walking with them. Just turns up. They don't know who it is. Jesus in disguise. Not really disguised, but they couldn't see who it was. And he's listening to the story. He says, what's going on? What's happening? Oh, this is happening in Jerusalem. It's all a, a horrendous story. da 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 And then as he's walking, he says, you stupid people. Do you not know? Were you not told? Didn't Jesus tell you before he died what was going to happen? Anyway, they were enthralled by this. So they said to him, spend the night with us when they got to Emmaus, and, and, and they said, when he was there, it was amazing. He just shared and talked and talked and talked about the kingdom. And it, their hearts started to burn. My heart was burning in worship this morning. It's that feeling, it's just, oh, takes your breath away. We're burning with this news. And all of a sudden, they have communion, and their eyes are open to see it's Jesus. Well, immediately, they're on the road again, going back to... Jerusalem to tell the story that Jesus really has risen. It's true. This is big news. So they went off to see all the disciples and tell them. And that journey is what Emmaus is all about. Can I wind up now? Because <laughs> I think you might want to say something. But you've got to hold on. I'm holding. Let me... Let me set Emmaus in, in some kind of little context, eh? You've got about five minutes to preach after this. You know? and, and I had, you remember, church, I, I was involved in a head-on collision some years ago. Remember that? About nine, ten years ago with Sue. And it was horrendous. And as I hit this car, all, all my pigeons left. And as a result of it, to this day, I can't remember people's names, Michael. So... It's a horrible thing. And, and your, your sense of humour got impacted in it pretty badly. Yes, and that got, right? bad, yeah, yeah, it got very, <laughs> very sad, my sense of humour, as a result. And anyway, I lost all my confidence for driving. And I thought I was a real smart driver, 40 years driving plus. And I, really, and I used to be in the motor trade, you know, all my life, motor cars. But I couldn't drive. And a guy in this church who was a, um, a, a driving instructor... And his name's just escaped me. We used to call him Feedback. Because he used to operate the PA. 
<laughs> he's a brilliant guy, a lovely guy. He was a driving instructor. And he said to me, why don't you go and take an advanced driving course? So, long story short, agreed with it. Went to a group here in Western Supermare, sat around a table with men older than me by far. And these are supposed to be expert drivers. And they took the through course, talky, talky, talky. Then they gave me what they call an observer. And that observer then was going to nurture me for 12 months and more to teach me to drive again. Well, I knew how to drive. I was a clever, clever driver. Except I'd had this accident and all my confidence had gone. They just sat in the seat next to me and they taught me again all the necessary things, right? Looking long, looking up, looking to the side, what's the car in your mirror, what colours the car, what make of it is it? Have you seen that ball running across the road there? What about children? What do you do for this? When you go through a school, da 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 da. And it's nurturing me, nurturing me. And it took me a year and over to actually become competent again. And, uh, and I got my advanced driving test. Now that is what Emmaus is about. It's about somebody just, we know all about it. We've heard all about it. But somebody just coming up to our side for a year or two and saying, you might have missed that. You might have forgotten that. Let's make an adjustment here. So that's how it works, isn't it? Completely that. We haven't got all the answers, but we're going to come alongside you for a couple of years just to encourage you in what God's already doing here, and how you become perhaps more intentional and strategic, and how you can link things together and work out how we share this good news that we have with our community. Brilliant, mate. Amen. Big hand to the man over there. Well done. It was a great interview, even though he didn't get <laughs> any time to answer the questions. I'm handing over to you, boss. Yeah, I'm not going to interview you, Claude. I just said, it'll be the longest interview ever, but there you go. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, Andy's going to come back in just a moment, and uh, I don't know whether, pul is the pulpit gone? I don't know where the pulpit's gone. Oh, can you bring the pulpit back? That'd be great. Um, and um, so Andy's coming back, and he's going he's gonna, to uh, speak to us now, um, you know, on whatever God's put on his heart, but we are on a journey. It's not a journey to say that we have not been sharing our faith, but it's allowing Emmaus to come alongside us to think, how can we become even better at what, what we already have? And that doesn't mean to say they're going to be here every week. It will be periodically. We're going to be going through a journey with them to sharpen us. Who wants to be sharpened more? I want to be sharpened. I want to be better equipped. I've got, I've got reasons why I don't share my faith the way that I, I would want to. Well, we want to, we want to be a church that is natural or become more natural at sharing. Not that people aren't natural already, but how can we do what we do even better? And I think that's a great journey to be on. And Andy, as an experienced communicator and also uh, got some great knowledge in the whole area of evangelism, as, as Claude as well, is going to be, they're going to be coming along and assisting us in, in that way. So... Um, Next week, uh, just to give you a little bit of a notice, we're having also uh, a week of prayer. A uh, week of prayer is what we're going to call Seek First. It's called Seek First, and that's going to start next week. It's going to be coming out. Uh, all the details are going to be on the website. But there's also a piece of paper at the back to give you all the prayer meetings. We've got loads of them. And it doesn't mean to say that we want you at all of them, but it would be good for you to look at and think, I'm going to go, we're going to seek God, and there's going to be a lot of public reading of Scripture. We're going to be declaring Scripture a lot, and then we're going to be praying through Scripture, you know, through that week. So that's going to be next week, and that's going to involve praying for things like Emmaus, how we share our faith as a church through the different ministries that we have. So we're really looking forward to that as well. And just because I forgot to mention at the beginning as well, there is a prayer gathering tonight at 6 o'clock here at the church. And also there is Put the Kettle On over in Burnham at Francis's house. Francis is at the back. You can wave at you. you know, uh, and the, the, that's going to be from 6.30, I believe. 6.30 at Francis's house. If you've got nothing else better to do tonight, you can go along to Francis. Or tonight, we're going to do both. You can come to the prayer gathering at 6. Now... Seeing as he's come all the way from London, and Andy's with us now, and he's uh, it's taken a long time for him to get here, we're going to invite him to come, and he's going to bring the Word of God to us. Let's give him a nice round of applause this morning. Hey, thank you so much. It's great to be here with you guys. Thank you for the interview, Claude. Yeah, fantastic. I think, yeah, a TV career may be ahead of you. Um, two quick things. Is first of all, um, you've been given one of these questionnaires thing as you came in. Um, it's basically, if you're a part of this church... 
Um, you've been here for a few years or whatever else. If you want to feel this, it would be helpful to understand where you're at with sharing your faith right now. So you can really understand how best we can serve you going forward. So if you're already a Christian and you're part of this church, you want to fill this in, it would be fantastic. Then go back to Dawn. But Dawn will not look at your answers and try and decipher your handwriting. She will just give them back to me. And then we'll post them and work out how best we can help you as a church going forward. So there's a QR code at the end of today as well. If you're digitally minded, you can digitally do that. And second of all, a little resource here called the five P's of missional development. Of course, over there. If you want to grab one of those at the end, you can as well to help explore some of the ideas we're going to be exploring in the next two years. I didn't really want to be a Christian. In my teenage years, I kind of rebelled against the whole Christian thing. I thought, I don't really believe all this stuff. I don't really want to do this whole thing. My dad was a Methodist minister. I got brought up in this whole kind of church atmosphere, but I rebelled lots in my teenage years. But as I began to rebel, I began to think, well, hang on a sec. I've got my links, I can chase off the girls, I can go out drinking and partying, but is there something more to life than this? Maybe this Christian thing has some truth to it. Maybe, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I remember one night, partying too hard, next morning waking up feeling pretty rough, and just saying, God, if you're real, can you show yourself to me in some way? At the age of 18, I went to go and work on a camp in America through a company called Camp America. It's a very clever name. And you had to work out, what can you teach American young people? And I scanned this list and I thought, okay, I can teach football or soccer. I can teach drama. Archery, that can't be that hard. I'll tick that box. I was missing one thing on this list. And I saw Bible stories was there. I thought, well, hang on a sec. I know Bible stories. I'll tick that box as well. To my shock and amazement, I then got put on a Salvation Army evangelistic camp working with gang members. So they flew me to to, to the uh, west coast of America and I turned up at this place and uh, turned up at this camp and it was the most intimidating thing ever. All these guys had um, one leg rolled up like this. That was kind of the thing at the time. And they had tattoos of the gangs they were in and then bullet holes and stab wounds. I'm like, yo, what's up, homie? How's it going, dog? I was like, hello. (laughs) I'm from England. (laughs) Cup of tea. And my job was to tell them about Jesus. I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm going to become a Christian martyr, even though I don't believe this stuff. (laughs) But during that summer, in my head, I kind of understood what the gospel was all about. And so I began to kind of drop things into conversations. And and to my absolute amazement, one of these huge guys who'd done some horrendous stuff with his life, ended up getting on his knees like this before a cross, and just weeping as he experienced the love and the grace of Jesus. He's doing that. I'm just there going, it works. <laughs> God, God's doing something there. I guess since that point, I've been passionate about working out how can we best share this good news that we have about Jesus and what he has done for each and every one of us. We're going to look at a passage today in Acts 17. Acts is the book after the four gospels that explores the story of the early church. I'm going to read a few verses from verse 16 onwards. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Oropagus. They said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. Father God, as we explore this ancient passage of scripture, we pray, God, you would speak afresh into our lives here in Western Supermare in the 21st century. We invite your spirit just to help as discover a fresh sense of who you are and of who you're calling us to be. Amen. And there are two kinds of drivers. Who here drives? Yeah? Okay. There's some drivers who, as soon as your tank and your petrol tank gets about halfway, you pull in and refill. Is that some of you here today? Very cautious, very sensible. What, two of you? You're quite okay. There's the other group who would like to see how far you can get when the red light has come on. Anyone here? Yeah. It's a fantastic game, isn't it? Until you lose. And then it's the most embarrassing thing ever. We have to walk, into, you walk to the petrol station 
and go and buy one of those kind of little containers for about 15 pounds, and you think, I've already got five of these, but it's not with me right now. And then you have to queue up amongst the cars. You've got a car in front of you, a car here, and a car behind you, and just you your tank like, hello, <laughs> waiting for petrol. <laughs> I think Paul, as he entered this city of Athens, I wonder if he actually felt like he was running a bit on empty. And perhaps there are some of us this morning that are running on full and are fully engaged with God and things are going really well. But perhaps for others of us, things are a bit running on empty. We feel like things aren't perhaps going quite as well as they could be. Paul enters the city of Athens. And it's a big city, 40,000 people, a significant city. And he's in this new place and he's all alone. He's left his friends behind and he's been persecuted previously. And he ends up in this big city all alone, this important city. And I wonder if in some ways he felt slightly like he was running on empty. It's a difficult place to be in. His friends Timothy and Silas were left behind and he was there all alone. Yeah, verse 16 on the slide there, there's this verse which says, While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. That word distress can have the idea of being provoked or angry or exasperated, which is a fantastic word. And what's interesting is that Paul was used to seeing idols. Every Gentile home would be full of idols. But Paul understood the implications of idols, that it robbed people of their true identity. And he ends up in this quite intimidating place, but even when he's there all alone, he allows God to begin to speak to him. Whether we are full or whether we empty, are we allowing God to speak afresh into our lives? My first challenge for us this morning is this, is are we open to God? Are we open to what God has called us to do? Are we open to God giving us his eyes, his insight, his view of how things are? We share our faith, not just to grow the church, not just to not feel guilty, not just to try and earn some sense of God loving us, but we do it because first and foremost we have experienced God's love and grace in our lives and it spills out of what we have discovered for ourselves. Are we open afresh this morning to what God wants to remind us of what he has done for each and every one of us, that he loves us, that he loves us, that he loves us? As you see this story, you might be thinking, idols. These people were so basic. I mean, who has idols really today? And yet, actually, I think as you look around society, the next slide down, we are in many ways surrounded by idols even today. The idols are perhaps of beauty or success, or fame, or riches, that actually all around us are these idols. Do they distress us like Paul became distressed? Do we allow God to speak into our lives what we see around us and the brokenness that we see around us? The truth is this, that all of us worship something. Everybody in Western Supermare worships something. The word worship comes from the Anglo-Saxon worship, giving something our worth. We all worship something, and what we worship shapes how we see ourselves. Paul, I think, becomes distressed. Because all these idols are robbing people of their true identity. As we walk around Western Supermare in our community, do we have a sense that people are being robbed of who they really are? Given these false identities that aren't true, that they need to know God's love and God's grace for them First of all, are we open to God? The second thing is this, is are we open to journeying with people? I had one moment um, in a church office when there was a knock on the door, a lady came in, 19 years of age, and said, I was walking past the church, and I just uh, had this real sense that I want to become a Christian, is that okay? I'm like, "Uh, yeah. So she had no church background at all, just walking past the church, this sense of conviction, I want to become a Christian. I'm like, uh, okay, great. So there and then we kind of led her to Jesus. It was amazing. That's happened to me once in my life. Generally, people's faith journeys take time. As they explore the truths of Jesus, what it means for their lives, often it is a journey. I had a friend at university who used to mock me relentlessly about my faith. And yet about 10 years after university, he emailed me saying, Andy, you'll never guess what. I became a Christian. But some people take a journey of speaking into their lives and seeing what God does over a period of time. In Acts 17, these verses continue on the next slide down. So he reasoned in the synagogue 
with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Great line. So Paul often began in the synagogue. He began with those who understood the Jewish history and the Jewish faith. He began with those people, but then he goes to the marketplace. Now, when you hear the marketplace, you might be thinking he kind of went to like a kind of New Testament kind of version of Tesco's. Is that what you imagine? But actually, it was much more than that. The, the term for it, the marketplace, is agora. Can you all say agora? agora. And again? Agora. And again? Agora. You all sound like pirates now, I think. It's fantastic. Agora. And really, the agora was much more than Tesco's. Almost these four symbols, next slide down, kind of paint a picture. It was a place where, yes, shopping was done. People bought their new boxer shorts there. But it was also the place where media was, where news about what was happening across the empire was shared. It was a place where news, uh, it was kind of like a BBC 24 kind of place where you could hear what was going on around the globe at that time. It was also a place of finance, where business deals were done. And it was also a place of the arts. We would perform and do different artistic things. This was the Agua. And what I love about it is that Paul's faith is not restricted to the synagogue, but he goes into the Agua. He goes where people are at. Where is your Agua? Where is a place where God has positioned you to share more of who he is? Where is your community, your street, your workplace, your coffee shop, your football club? Where are the places where God has positioned you to share more of who he is? In verse 17, he begins to journey day by day. Not a one-hit wonder, but he journeys over time with these people. And in verse 18, the word debate is almost the idea of a dialogue. It begins to have conversations about faith with these people, what, what life is all about. And it comes across these two groups. The next slide down. You have the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans believed that God created everything and then kind of just left. And they thought the meaning of life was to be happy. Therefore, we have Mr. Happy on the slide. Then there were the Stoics. The Stoics believed that everything could be understood. There was a natural law and a spiritual law. They had no belief in a creator. They said the most important thing is to be good. Interesting, these two narratives at the time were about being happy and about being good. I think perhaps in our culture today, those two narratives are very similar again. Do whatever makes you happy. Be happy. Or just behave and do, your, do what's right for society. Be good. These two narratives. And into this, Paul is speaking about Jesus and the resurrection. They are really confused by it. They call him a babbler. What is this babbler trying to say? Sometimes when we share our faith, people will be quite rude. They'll go, what are you trying to say, you babbler? Or perhaps even much worse in certain circumstances. And it's the idea of, like a, a, of a bird kind of picking up seeds. There's a kind of, kind of metaphor they have, this idea of a babbler, that he kept picking up seeds and dropping seeds. What was Paul really speaking about? What was this whole thing about? There is something about his confidence and the way that he engages where they want to know more. And Paul is up for journeying with them as they go forwards. A few years ago, I, um, I, I do various different sports. I took up boxing for a season. Uh, which is kind of a, a strange thing to do, perhaps. I did some white-collar boxing where you basically um, you train for two months and you have a fight. And it was the most bizarre thing in London because you end up with kind of two groups of people in these boxing gyms. There are certain people who are kind of white-collar boxers who are kind of like, who are just kind of working full-time and kind of do boxing, but are quite posh. And as you kind of punch them, they'll, they'll punch you and go, oh, so sorry. <laughs> oh, so sorry. <laughs> and there's another group who are more like the people who generally have fights regularly. And they kind of turned up at the gym as well. And I remember the first time we were sparring together, we hadn't really learned to defend. We were just sparring. And I got put with this guy who was quite aggressive. And he started throwing these punches at me. So I sort of started throwing punches at him. Both of us just throwing punches, both of us failing to protect ourselves at all. And after three rounds, uh, I kind of went home that night and began to get headaches. I remember Googling uh, boxing and brain damage. How serious is this thing? <laughs> thinking, well, perhaps I shouldn't do this anymore. And I got a real sense of fear. Almost fear kind of overcame. I thought, I'm not going to go back. I'm going to stop doing this. 
it's stupid, I'm not going to go back, I, I'm just too fearful. And I thought, oh no, well, maybe, I, maybe I should go back one more time. Maybe, maybe we're different next time. So I went back to the same gym again, and so I get into groups, the same groups as last time. And I was like, no. And this guy came and said, um, just you're aware, last time we sparred, I had some headaches, so can we kind of take it easy? I'm like, yes, definitely, <laughs> we can definitely take it easy. Kind of very soft punches in the whole time. But the idea that actually fear can be really a powerful thing. As I was in that boxing gym over the few weeks that I was there, I got to share my faith so many times in so many ways. And it was a real privilege to go and do that. But I think the idea that fear can be so powerful. They can stop us from speaking about what we've discovered in Jesus. Perhaps for some of us, fear almost stops us from speaking. Even this week, you've had moments when you could have shared something, but the fear got a hold of you. Part of this thing about it's about journeying with people and seeing what God is doing in their lives, about being present as they journey going forwards. In verse 19, they then take Paul to the meeting of the Oropagus. Next slide down is the idea, are we open to paintings? The first thing is, are we open to God? Are we open to God helping us to see the world how he sees the world, that since being distressed by the idols? Are we open to journeying with people as they explore the Christian faith? And third of all, are we open to painting, to painting a picture of God? You might have heard the story about the um, the girl in school, and she's painting a picture. And the teacher says, "Eh, what are you painting? She says, I am painting a picture of God. And the teacher says to her, well, but nobody knows what God looks like. The girl says, they will in a minute. I love that story. The idea actually, how do we begin to paint a picture of God? Paul, in this passage, gets taken to a place called the Oropagus. The next verse is the next slide down. It says this. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Oropagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The next slide down is a picture of the Oropagus, also called Mars Hill. This 50-foot high kind of rocky outcrop where the assembly of the Supreme Court of Athens met. And it was surrounded by religious art. In the background was this massive temple to the goddess Athena, the goddess of war. And there you would have had some of the key thinkers of the day. Paul gets almost a dress, a bit like, I guess, the best lecturers from Oxford and Cambridge all at the same time. And Paul gets this opportunity because he's willing to journey with them and they take on this journey. He keeps going there day by day and he gets this opportunity to begin to paint a picture of who God is. And Paul begins to paint. And the first thing he does is this. He says in those first verses, I see you are very religious. Most times in Acts, Paul begins with a story, the Jewish story, but here he begins with their culture. And rather than condemning their culture, he begins by sensing there's something in your culture that's asking questions. He affirms their sense of religion. Next slide down is this question I think is so pivotal as we look to sharing our faith is this. What is God already doing? We don't bring God to situations. We don't bring God to meetings. We don't bring God to the workplace. God is already present all around us. He's already at work in people's lives. And the question is, what is God already doing? Paul says, I see you are very religious. He doesn't condemn, but he actually affirms that. And he says, you've got this altar. This altar to an unknown God. And I want to tell you who this God is. I think in our culture, God's often at work in people's lives. It's about digging out and working out what are the questions we can ask to discover what God is doing. Phrases like, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I have a sense of guilt that I carry. I don't believe, but I sometimes pray. What is it that God is already doing in people's lives. There was some research done last year by Talking Jesus looking at some kind of data across the UK and they found that many people are much more open to the gospel than we realise. Many are asking the question, will everything be okay? 
We have a, a gospel that speaks into the questions that they are asking. Next slide down is this, this kind of painting that Paul does with these words. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He's saying there is one God and this backdrop behind him is this big temple and he's saying, you know what, there's one God and he can't fit in your temple. It's actually quite a provocative thing to have said. This temple is not big enough for our God. He continues. And he's not served by human hands as if he did anything. Rather, he himself gives everything life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. He's saying if you look at creation, it points towards a creator. He's not just my God, but he is the God of all humanity. Then he continues, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets say, we are his offspring. God wants to be found. This picture he paints of God. And then again he draws upon their poetry, he draws upon their culture. They live in a culture, next slide down, where it's just full of these different kind of gods and different ways of worshipping. And here are three gods, the god of Hermes, Poseidon and Hera. Hermes isn't the god of delivery, just in case you're wondering. Um, the god of business, and it was the god of the sea, and then the god of the protector of marriage. And in Athens at that time, they had all these different gods they worshipped, and the whole culture was around, how do I do, how do I do, how do I do, how do I serve these gods so that perhaps I can in some way get a blessing? What must I do to be accepted by these gods? Do more, do more, do more. And I think in many ways our culture is often about doing more, doing more, doing more. How do I achieve something? How, do I, how am I accepted? How do I understand who I am? We need to do more and do more and do more and do more and do more. The verses continue on the next slide down. Now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. The challenge he has for them is that sense of repentance, that changing direction, that changing of thinking, that stepping into our true identity. And the reaction is not all of them believe, but some of them believed. And some of them became followers going forwards. The final slide is this picture here of Jesus. I think in this culture back in Athens, it was about do, do, do. How do I earn the God's acceptance? What do I do to get the God's blessings? And yet the Christian faith isn't about do, do, do. It isn't about trying to earn God's grace and God's love and God's forgiveness. It's about, it is done, it is done, it is done. The words of Jesus on the cross, it is finished. We don't earn God's grace. We just choose to receive God's grace. It's a countercultural message which speaks powerfully, I think, into our context here today. Paul was open. He was open to God. He became distressed by the idols. Do we become distressed around us? We get perhaps so blasé about our faith, we forget that people are so lost and broken that they need to know they are loved by God. He was open to journeying with people, day by day being in the same place, asking the question, what is God up to? And when the opportunity comes, he was open to painting a picture of who God is. This morning... Are we open to God? And that picture of Jesus, I think, just the one back again, is, is that it's done. So do we need to receive afresh again his love and his grace in our lives? Sharing our faith comes first and foremost from discovering that we are loved by him. It's a, an outflow, a response to all that he has done for us. So right now, if you want to just close your eyes and open your hands. Let me just say you're open to God physically with your hands open.
Father, we thank you for this ancient story that speaks so powerfully into our context here today. And as Paul was open to you, we open our hands here this morning and say we are open to you here. We invite your spirit to remind us again just of your love you have for each and every one of us. Your love that was demonstrated in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. God, we're open to you just giving us a fresh view of our relationships and our contacts and our context. Help us to see things how you see things. May we become distressed by the things that are not right as we look around our communities. Help us see what you are already doing. We invite you, by your spirit, to mess up our lives, to challenge us afresh, to give us a fresh sense of urgency for the good news we have. Amen. Amen. Just to finish off this morning, that if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never actually said yes to what he has done for you in his life and his death and his resurrection, you want to this morning... I'd love you to lead you in a prayer during that office. If you're over here to one side, do come and see me. And perhaps for some of you here again, just as long as I was sharing about fear, fear has been something that's really kind of grabbed your heart perhaps in some ways, then I just feel again this morning that perhaps God wants to speak into your life and give you a sense of freedom from that fear as well. Over to you. Thank you so much. Now, um, the practical, I know time time has gone, um, but uh, there's going to be a QR code that will come up uh, at some point. If you've got a mobile phone and you're smart, okay, you can just beep it on there and you can fill in the the, the actual questionnaire and it will get sent automatically to Emmaus. All all of this is anonymous. You 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 don't put your name on it. It's it's for us just to to find out where we are as a church when it comes to sharing our faith now. And in two years' time... How far have we come from where we were? So there's a journey that we're going to be on. If you don't have a smartphone and you probably don't like doing it that way, then we do have a physical questionnaire, like we said. So please do take that, fill it in, and you're going to give that back to Dawn. You know, and it's all anonymous. You don't put your name on it at all so, uh, so that we can just gauge where the whole church is. And so we need to find out where are we so that we can determine where are we going when it comes to uh, journeying with Emmaus and Andy and Claude and, and the team as we go forward. Thank you for um, being with us today. Uh, I encourage you, if you're not a Christian, go and see Andy or myself or any of the ministers in the church. We would love to talk to you about who Jesus is and uh, what it means uh, when he is our Lord and Savior. Uh, And for us as Christians, we want to empower you to to share your faith even better than we already are. And that's the joy uh, of the journey that's coming ahead. So let's all stand together. We're going to pray one more prayer uh, as we leave. Uh, Thank you for being patient with us a little bit longer this morning, and that's great that we've been able to listen in. Lord, we thank you for your presence in our worship today, but your presence never leaves us. May we, Lord, be the carriers, not just of the divine in your presence, but also because we've been been given that divine truth to share. Help us, Lord, from now. Lord, just to be mindful, Lord, of the opportunities that we come across, that we may make the most of the opportunities. We commit Andy as he travels back, and Claude, we thank you for them. We commit our church to you, and we commit, Lord, also the many difficult things that are happening in our world. Oh, God, have mercy. And you have had mercy, because now you send us to be the carriers of good news into a broken world. So thank you for this time together. Bless us, leaders and guiders, as we go into this new week, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Amen. You are free to go. You are dismissed. If you need prayer for anything, please come forward. We would love to pray with you about anything at all. God bless you. Have a great remainder of the day. Tea and coffee still at the back. God bless. Okay. Lots of free things at the front, so if you would like one of the, uh, the, the pieces of literature that Andy, they are all free. Uh, if you would like to come to the front and collect them, this will be part of the journey as we go on.